Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Takas. I'm the director of engineering at Spring. I oversee all of our uh, engineering teams across kind of the product organization. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about how we've scaled our product using a headless commerce approach. Hey, everyone, and I'm Paris Chana. I'm a senior engineering manager here at Spring. Uh, I oversee our commerce and partnerships teams here. Uh, commerce focuses on all our commerce services that power the platform. And uh, our partnerships team focuses on building commerce experiences on other platforms like uh, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, and places like that. Yeah, so I'll hand it over to Rick to talk a little bit more about who we are at Spring. For those that aren't familiar, uh, Spring is a platform that allows people to create and sell online. Um, we work closely um, with partners and with our creators to, to just really make the platform something that enables the creators to build their own brands and their own businesses. Um, through our integrations, they can kind of build their own, make their own products and take them to YouTube or Twitch or, or wherever they're at. Um, so just some stats around um, kind of the scale we're at today. Um, so we um, are the kind of leading, leading creator commerce platform in the space. Um, we have over 7.2 million creators, six and a half million stores have been created, over 2 billion products have been created on our platform. And just last year, we had 1.1 million creators, you know, design and sell a product and, and, and be successful. Um, part of what helps us hit that scale is through our partnerships and integrations. So we have a partnership with YouTube, Instagram, Twitch, TikTok, and integrations on Discord. Um, we have several more in the works and are looking to just continue to get to where our creators are. Um, so let's talk a bit about, you know, where we started from a technology standpoint. Um, when we first started, we had a Ruby on Rails monolith in a mono repo. Um, this allowed us uh, to pivot quickly with just a few engineers. Um, we could try a lot of different things. We could um, you know, use different technologies where it was kind of best suited. Um, as you can imagine, this doesn't scale super well. Um, you know, we had Backbone and jQuery and React and ERB templates and a bunch of other things we had our own customer old eventing system along with um, you know, some open source eventing systems and, and things. And so this just, as we've scaled, became really hard to kind of untangle, um, which is why we kind of started taking the shift to more of a headless approach and a headless commerce approach, building out our own APIs and kind of going with a more service-driven architecture. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Paris, who's going to talk more in detail about the thought process and um, how we kind of designed our system. Great, thanks Rick. So when we were first looking at how to design our new system and taking this more service-driven approach as opposed to what we had in the past with our monolith, we really had to think about what's the best way to tackle this problem. And uh, it's we're really easy to be tempted to rebuilding everything. And uh, the reality is, is that this can oftentimes like put you in a more difficult position than where you started. Uh, especially when we look at the amount of work that went into previous uh, objects. So things like state, um, we have a lot of logic that exists around like, hey, when's a product visible to an end user? Uh, same thing around checkout, especially with payments. Uh, we have a lot involved in regarding cost calculation, even stuff with geolocation for, for tax calculations and, and local law and things like that. So we really have to strike this balance of when do we rebuild and uh, what stuff do we kind of keep around and translate? So before we even began trying to make those decisions, we really had to take a hard look at if we were to use our API today to build a commerce experience, would it be pretty straightforward or is it a little bit more difficult to understand? And when we looked at it, almost everything needed to be translated. Uh, things in the past really didn't translate well to this uh, uh, creator commerce world. Um, really everything from even the way our original platform was built as more of a marketplace. Um, a lot of the terminology just didn't translate one to one. So if you're a developer, uh, it became a little more difficult to actually even find the right resources to build something. Uh, so with that, we really looked at and we looked at like every app that we've built in the past, as well as what our partners are, are building or planning to build. And we tried to think about like what would be the perfect API for them? So we like painstakingly went through everything it took to build every feature and see, uh, hey, can we use our API today? And uh, we designed the perfect API that we called the Commerce API. And uh, it was really clean and really easy to use to build something both for ourselves and for our partners. 
Now, um, that's all fine and dandy, having that idealistic API that we designed. But the reality is we have to figure out a way to translate what we have into this perfect API. And that's uh, always a little bit easier said than done. Um, so what we ended up coming up with was something uh, pretty interesting here. So we actually looked at all of our legacy models and we actually proxied it through API Gateway. And in front of it, what we did was we built a bunch of adapters to kind of translate the legacy model into something a little more consumable by the front end. And we did this kind of everywhere, both from like actually creating a commerce experience to the back end of getting orders into our system. Uh, this is something that all of our apps have to do. Same with our partner apps, like some like when it goes to our stores, stuff our third party developers make, as well as the uh, uh, in-app experience on places like uh, Twitch, YouTube, and places like that. Uh, so this gave us a lot of flexibility. It even gave us the ability to, hey, now that we have inputs and outputs defined and people are using them, maybe we can change what powers that backend. Maybe it doesn't have to be the legacy model. Maybe that's something a little bit easier to abstract out into another service or refactor. It just gave us a lot more to work with there now that things are a little bit more defined and structured and easy to understand for uh, a front end developer. Uh, so if we really hone in on individual pieces here, uh, our partners are where we get a lot of our traffic and usage. And uh, through that in the past, it's always been incredibly difficult to maintain in our monolith. Uh, we had to maintain separate product feeds for every one of our platforms. And whenever a change happened, let's say a product goes out of stock or a creator updates like a title on a product, um, we had to like go and regenerate these product feeds for every one of their platforms that they're associated with. And that can be a pretty painful and lengthy process, both from a terms of resources as well as uh, as well as developer time. Um, so what we really did was take this model and really approach it here as well. So whenever we generate a product feed, we actually do it in a very generic way that's uh, lined up with the direction of the company, but uh, might be a little different than something that YouTube or Twitch is expecting. So we build something generic and then we have a bunch of lambdas that actually adapt that generic feed into something that a partner might understand. So really from a maintenance standpoint, really only have to maintain one feed and uh, all the other partners are just kind of happy through these adapters. Uh, so we really went down the line and did that with every single partner that we had. <laughs> and it made, put us in a much better spot. So whenever a product goes out of stock, we update the one feed and then all our partners are, are reflecting that new status. Uh, and we did that on the other side as well. So this, uh, so when, we, when it comes to orders, it's kind of a two-way street. We have to get them into our system, then we also have to update the orders on the way out when they ship or things like that. Uh, so um, this is something pretty similar to product feeds where every, every uh, partner has a slightly different way that they uh, have an order object. So what we did was we actually built uh, a bunch of adapters, which basically um, adapt the partner uh, approach to orders and adapts into something more generic that our system at Spring can understand. Uh, so we did this for every partner and now we really only have to maintain one feed when an order comes in and posts to our API, we can adapt it for our system. And um, same thing on the way out when an order ships, we can push it out in a very extremely generic way. And uh, then it gets adapted for the partner in question. And really our end developers really just have to think about that one generic feed. And we don't have to think about every single partner at play, which of course is growing over time. Uh, yeah. So I'll pass it back over to Rick to talk about um, how this is actually used in action and in the real world. So we've, you know, we've wrapped our Ruby on Rails monolith. Um, we've built out our commerce API. We're using adapters to connect to our partners and even in a lot of cases to our own front end apps to kind of normalize that data. Um, with six and a half million stores sitting on Netlify, um, we kind of have a deployment process where we do kind of um, stage releases. So we might release to kind of 1% of users, scale that up, and then kind of through a few stages, release to everybody and, and trigger deploys. Um, we do get preview apps when we push pull requests um, to GitHub. Uh, and we kind of control that flow through GitHub and RCI and, and Netlify to roll it out. Um, this is turning out to just work really well and scale really well to get up to six and a half million stores um, that are easily deployable and um, 
have great uptime and are just much faster and a much better solution than what we had on our legacy platform has been a big accomplishment. And um, it's just working really well and kind of proving that the kind of Jamstack approach, the headless approach just, just scales really well. Um, we are um, kind of in the next steps. We're, we're moving towards some static site generation. Um, I don't know that we'll fully get there out of the gate just because of the way our product kind of lifecycle works. Sometimes we need real-time data, but we are trying to move to more of a static site generation for, for just better uh, user experience. Um, we're looking into a bunch of API caching along with build caching. So when we do deploy six and a half million sites, um, it, it's just a much faster experience. Right now, you know, it, it's, it's pretty quick, but it could be, could be faster. Um, we're looking at incremental builds. Um, so with Next and Netlify, um, as we kind of go down that path, um, we can actually just kind of update and deploy just, just the pieces that have changed rather than having to redeploy and rebuild the whole site. Uh, so looking into that, and, and we are exploring potentially opening our API up to a more public facing version. Um, right now when we're working with our partners, we, we give them access, but we haven't kind of gone the full path to a public facing API. So we're exploring that as a potential, um, as a potential option to allow people just to build whatever they want on Spring. Um, yeah, so that really kind of wraps up um, our, our main presentation on how we've used the headless commerce approach to scale um, our stores and, and platform at Spring. So just one more thing I wanted to mention before we wrap up, um, we are hiring. So if you're interested in joining the Spring team, uh, take a look at our open roles at applied.workable.com slash spring for creators. Uh, we'd love to have you come aboard. Um, so that wraps up our talk on how we've scaled um, our platform with the a headless commerce approach. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, do reach out. Uh, our contact information is on the screen. Thank you so much.